Some Thoughts Concerning Education, the 1824 text Some Thoughts Concerning Education, a 1693 treatise concerning the education of gentlemen, was regarded for over a century as the most important philosophical work on education in Britain. The text was translated into almost all of the major written European languages during the 18th century, and nearly every European writer on education after Locke including Jean-Jacques Rousseau, acknowledged its influence. Locke outlines a new theory of mind, contending that the gentleman's mind was a tabula rasa or blank slate, containing no innate ideas. The treatise explains how to educate that mind using three distinct methods. The development of a healthy body, the formation of a virtuous character, and the choice of an appropriate academic curriculum. Locke attempts to popularize several strands of 17th century educational reform as well as introduce his own philosophical ideas on education. English writers such as John Evelyn, John Aubrey, John E. Atchard and John Milton had previously advocated similar reforms in curriculum and teaching methods but they had not succeeded in reaching a wide audience. As England became increasingly mercantilist and secularist, the humanist educational values of the Renaissance, which had enshrined scholasticism, came to be regarded by many as irrelevant. Following in the intellectual tradition of Francis Bacon, who had challenged the cultural authority of the classics, reformers such as Locke argued against Cambridge and Oxford's degree that all bachelor and undergraduates in their disputations should lay aside their various authors, such that caused many dissensions and strifes in the schools, and only follow Aristotle and those that defend him, and take their questions from him, and that they exclude from the schools all sterile and inane questions, disagreeing from the ancient and true philosophy. Instead of demanding that their sons spend all their time studying Greek and Latin texts, an increasing number of families began to demand a practical education for their sons, by exposing them to the emerging sciences, mathematics, and the modern languages, these parents hoped to prepare their sons for the changing economy and, indeed, for the new world they saw forming around them. In 1684 Edward Clark asked his friend, John Locke, for advice on raising his son and heir, Edward, Jr., Locke responded with a series of letters that, eventually served as the basis of some thoughts concerning education. But it was not until nine years later in 1693, encouraged by the Clarks and another friend, William Molyneux, that Locke actually published the treatise. Locke felt timid when it came to public exposure and decided to publish the text anonymously, as he had done with other major works. Although Locke revised and expanded the text five times before he died, he never substantially altered its style. Of Locke's major claims in the treatise, two factors play a defining role in 18th century educational theory. The first is that education makes the man, as Locke writes at the opening of his treatise, I think I may say that of all the men we meet with, nine parts of ten are what they are, good or evil, useful or not, by their education. Locke argues against both the Augustinian view of man, which grounds its conception of humanity in original sin, and the Cartesian position which holds that man innately knows basic logical propositions. Locke posits an empty mind, a tabula rasa, that is filled by experience. In describing the mind in these terms, Locke draws from Plato's Theatres, which suggests that the mind is like a wax tablet. Although Locke argues strenuously for the tabula rasa theory of mind, he nevertheless believes in innate talents and interests. Locke also discusses a theory of the self. He writes, the little and almost insensible impressions on our tender infancies have very important and lasting consequences. That is, the associations of ideas made when young are more significant than those made when mature because they are the foundation of the self, they mark the tabula rasa. In the treatise, in which he first introduces the theory of the association of ideas, Locke warns against letting a foolish maid convince a child that goblins and sprites are associated with the darkness, for darkness shall ever afterwards bring with it those frightful ideas, and they shall be so joined, that he can no more bear the one than the other. 
Locke's emphasis on the role of experience in the formation of the mind and his concern with false associations of ideas has led many to characterize his theory of mind as passive rather than active. Locke dedicates the bulk of some thoughts concerning education to explaining how to instill virtue in children. He defines virtue as a combination of self-denial and rationality, that a man is able to deny himself his own desires, cross his own inclinations, and purely follow what reason directs as best, though the appetite lean the other way. Future virtuous adults must be able not only to practice self-denial but also to see the rational path. Locke is convinced that children can reason early in life and that parents should address them as reasoning beings. Moreover, he argues that parents should, above all, attempt to create a habit of thinking rationally in their children. Locke continually emphasizes habit over rule. Children should internalize the habit of reasoning rather than memorize a complex set of prohibitions. This focus on rationality and habit corresponds to two of Locke's concerns in the essay concerning human understanding. 